uh, welcome all you guys. It seems good to see you again, and welcome our guests uh, to the to the meeting. Um, we uh, we have Anson that's with us, and he's not muted, so he's good to go. And uh, Abby's and and uh, Jean is with us, so uh, we may as well get started and. Um, I, I thought Anson this morning, um, we'd get an update uh, in regards to the, the dairy pricing uh, situation and, and how you guys were, you know, you, the administration, um, what your thinking is in putting together a, a plan of some type uh, to help these guys out. Um, I know you got a copy of what we talked about, and I think uh, Michael sent you a copy, right? And this is the one that uh, I think maybe the the house had it, uh, talked about yesterday. Is that the one with the with the three tier and the sort of the yeah, three tier direct pay? Yeah, yeah. I, I I got a chance to look at it quickly overnight, and and uh, thank you for that. So um, you wanna take sure. off? Sure, well, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, other members and, and the public that's joining us on this. I think I wanna begin with just talking about um, the three approaches uh, that are gonna help uh, our farmers. So the first approach is, you know, we've been, uh, you know, right from the uh, get-go with following what's happening on the, at the federal level as they rolled out uh, some programs uh, through the care package. So let's talk about what's happening on, on the federal level just uh, for a moment. Um, there's a number of things that they're working on. Um, they have, USDA has announced that they will have uh, direct payments uh, to dairy farmers. Uh, they're be beginning to put that program together. Um, and the goal is sometime in May uh, that USDA uh, through FSA uh, will get those payments uh, to dairy farmers uh, across the country. Uh, they're also working on a surplus uh, food uh, through the surplus food program. Uh, they announced this week uh, USDA is going to purchase uh, another $120 million uh, worth of uh, food uh, and $120 million, and I should say that's just for dairy. Uh, it's called their Fresh Buy program. And they're also working on a, a box program as well. Uh, and the agency uh, with uh, Trevor Lowell, who works with the education department, uh, has been working with potential Vermont vendors that could help uh, supply those boxes uh, with Vermont dairy. So that program is, is being put together as well. We also have heard a lot about, about the, the couple of programs through SBA and the federal program, uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. This week, they announced that uh, uh, agriculture was now eligible for that. Uh, that's a $60 billion program, and they opened it up just to agriculture this week. They were uh, put at the front of the line because they were not allowed yeah. to enter before. Before you, before you go on with that, Anson, are you getting, is somebody in the agency mailing uh, this notice out to all the small farms uh, or all the farms that could possibly qualify for that? Yeah, I think uh, working with the congressional de delegation and thanks to the congressional delegation, we've done a lot of messaging uh, right out of the right out of the box on that. To get the information to uh, to our farmers. Uh, we've been using mostly through the digital way of every possible platform we could get it to folks to to do that. Uh, SBA gave us a heads up it was coming, so we were ready to do the messaging on that. So that's one thing that, and we're encouraging. And SBA has told us that. Um, Farmers need to get in line for that. Don't wait uh, because the money again could run out. Uh, but right now it's, it's just open to agriculture uh, right now for, for signing up. Um, also the PPP program, we, we've talked about that a little bit. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program is another program through, the, uh, uh, through SBA that is being rolled out as well. Uh, just yeah. quickly uh, on a couple of things. Yeah, go ahead, Senator. Rick has a question for you, Anson. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted a fuller answer to the chair's question. So you're not mailing it directly. Can you just tell us more concretely? Well, how, I think, how do we I think, think farmers are hearing about this? I think they're hearing it through uh, our listserv. Uh, we have a we have a very big listserv through the agency that uh, Diane Boffel sends out. 
Uh, we put it on Facebook, we've got it on Twitter, we've done uh, all those type of things. Also, it's been amplified by um, a number of, uh, of our partners um, through, you know, working lands, through all the people that are involved in agriculture to message that it's out there. So we think that's the, the quickest way to do it. Um, uh, we don't do a lot of, uh, you know, direct mail these days out of the agency, but we do, um, you know, AgriView is a monthly publication, and that's mainly the uh, avenue we use for uh, communicating with our farmers, but the timeliness of that is 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 a little difficult, but um, How about we, the, like the, the uh, Franklin, uh, what's the St. Albans Messenger, some of the regional papers? I know there was a press release that was put out uh, by SBA on that, so whether they picked it up or not. Not sure. The the farm groups uh, like uh, Rural Vermont uh, Farm Bureau, all those folks are tuned. They're in. all they're all on our our list for distribution, and we've we've uh, they should have gotten a notice from us uh, that they that that, that yeah. was eligible. Because I was talking with a farmer yesterday from Holland, and he didn't know. Mm -hmm. He didn't know anything about it, and he milks a hundred cows. He's a small farm, but he didn't know anything about it. And I got it through my emails from SBA, so I, I've been chatting with him about how to keep him going, and mm -hmm. I, so I called him and told him that he wanted, you know, the website and all that stuff that he wanted to get onto it because, you know, that that would pay him six to a thousand dollars a week that uh, of course they aren't getting through their milk checks so right keep and we can able. and we can we can we can blast out some more uh information as well and keep messaging that to folks and if anyone has one that um a, a constituent or a, a farmer that we want some personal attention from us we can we can help them as well yeah um, I just wanted to maybe uh, define um, the situation that, that our dairy farmers uh, are in right now. So, um, and I'm going to I'm going to boil it down to um, to a gallon. So I think we all purchase our milk uh, by the gallon or quart or so forth. So, you know, on, and these are averages. Um, so I, I, I preface that this is the average. Every farmer is different. The cost of production for every farm could be different. But if we take, um, you know, the cost of production for the most part in the Northeast is about $20 uh, per hundred weight. Well, that's about $1.70 per gallon it takes a farmer produce. For every gallon that they produce, it takes about $1.70 to produce it. Right now, the forecasting is that they're going to get about a dollar per gallon. So there are, they are faced with losing about 70 cents uh, per gallon that they produce. So you multiply that in the thousands of gallons that farmers are producing each day, uh, you get a pretty clear picture uh, of the devastation that they're facing over the next few months if these forecasts uh, become true. So for every every gallon that they're producing on the farm right now, um, the forecasting is showing, uh, and this is an average, that they're losing about 70 cents per gallon when they make it. So I think that sort of gives a perspective of, uh, of the situation that our, our dairy farmers are in right now. We have been working with a number of private foundations as well to supplement and see if we can get some micro grants out as well. Um, working with the Vermont Community Foundation. Uh, today, uh, we, ha we are announcing a program uh, with the help of the several partners, including dairy farmers, uh, the Vermont Community Foundation, um, uh, Commonwealth Dairy, uh, Hood and um, Booth Brothers, um, and DFA of St. Albans. Uh, we have received, the agency has put together a program working with these partners to uh, purchase milk that uh, likely would have been disposed of and, and not found its way to the market. Uh, so we're going to take that milk uh, this week. It's being delivered to the food bank, it's being processed into gallons, and that milk will be distributed to uh, the uh, to needy Vermonters that need some nutrition and also Commonwealth. Uh, we're also going to produce uh, some yogurt uh, that will be distributed as well. Uh, we're grateful for the, the private contribution uh, by the Vermont Community Foundation and, and President Dan Smith uh, for putting that grant together with us and giving us some dollars. So the farmers being paid, uh, there's been some uh, 
uh, donations as well as along the way, but we think that's a good program and we hope to keep that program going. That helps the farmer because uh, that milk is not being disposed of. Uh, it's, 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 getting, it's also getting somewhere where it's needed. So that's sort of the, the private aspect of it. We're working on uh, working with private partners. And then, um, as you mentioned, the top senator, um, we are working, um, uh, trying to develop uh, a, a, a state program as well, like your, your committee and uh, members of the legislature. Um, the governor has repeatedly stated that um, agriculture is very important to the state. Um, he knows that our agriculture community is, is hurting, our dairy farmers are hurting, and we are in the stages of trying to uh, stand up a program um, uh, to provide some relief uh, to, uh, to dairy farmers through this process. But, um, you know, if we know the problem and we know how much they're losing and we know how much money we've got, um, why can't we set up a program? I think, I think we're headed to set up a program, Senator. I, I don't think I can announce one today, uh, but I think all the energy is, is, is focused on that. We've had uh, very good conversations with the Commerce Agency as well. Um, you know, they're sort of taking the lead and we've been working with them uh, on, a, uh, on a program that will help our dairy farmers. Um, uh, we've been talking with dairy farmers as well. They've been weighing in on, on the need and, and so forth. We've been talking with them. We've been talking with um, policymakers as well. So I think, you know, the, the, it, it's something that uh, we just got to work our way through. We know, the, we know the urgency that is out there. This is not something that we're going to, uh, you know, wait a few months to, to roll out. If we, if we get to the point where we can do something, uh, we want to get something out to the dairy community and the agriculture community as quickly as possible because there are other people outside, um, people that are milking cows and, and sheep and goats that are in, in this line as well. We've got to think about the businesses that rely on dairy as well. We know it's a $2 billion a year uh, business. So you've got businesses that are connected to dairy farming and close stores. You've got the people that supply the farmers with uh, products. We've got feed, we've got seed, we've got fertilizer. All that is, is, is at risk if we do not get some uh, dollars to our dairy farmers. So we're, we're working on a plan. We're just not ready for you know, prime time at this, at this point, but uh, we've got a couple more steps that we need to work through and, and we look forward to having conversations with your committee and others in state government. Yeah, uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate being uh, here this morning and, and listening to uh, Anson's report. The, Diversion of the milk to the food uh, banks, and you mentioned that it's being um, paid for partially, I guess, by grants and private donations. To, to what extent is that falling short of allowing um, all that milk to get? Rather than getting dumped, it's very good news to hear that it's getting to a, a food bank. And then I have another question too, but I'm just curious uh, is there state money? Is is part of the CARES money already helping with that? Uh, the CARES money is is not part of this. This was this initial rollout is being financed uh, by private dollars to the foundation. Um, they have they've got a program going that they're raising money uh, through their organization to try to help with relief, and they've uh, agreed to give us a, a sixty thousand dollar donation uh, to begin. Uh, to get this program up and running. We know it. Uh, we know there's going to be more need both from uh, the public for nutritious uh, milk and yogurt. So we hope to build on that. If other partners want to jump on board and uh, if they want to contribute money to the Vermont Community Foundation, they have, uh, they have a program where they, they accept a donation. So we hope to keep it going. This is the, we've got all the players together to get this uh, moving. As you can well imagine, it's, it's a little bit of comp, it's, it gets a little complicated of, of processing and distribution, but we're pretty proud of all the people that um, stood up quickly and, and, and decided this is, this is the way to go. The other question I had, Mr. Secretary, and it may be a Abby could answer it or certainly Diane could. Um, when we got together last, we still were hearing that there were supermarket chains that had uh, signs up that said, that you could only buy a certain amount of uh, milk or dairy products. Is that still an issue or 
has have we been able to sort of let Vermonters know they can buy as much as they possibly can? Yeah, we, we uh, have done a lot of engagement with them. Uh, I'm not hearing you answer. You listen to me now? I... Yep. You're there? Okay. Uh, Senator, we've done a lot of uh, work with the uh, on the retail side. Um, we blasted out a letter to uh, every retailer in Vermont asking them, please do not limit dairy purchases. We are hearing anecdotal evidence from time to time that some of those signs are still up. Um, and um, um, we're trying to just, you know, take it case by case basis. So if people do hear that that's happening, you know, let us know and maybe we can make a phone call and maybe if a store is not getting product enough, maybe they're having challenges of getting a dairy into the store at a, at a quantity they need, maybe we can help uh, effort the channels to that as well. But we've done, um, you know, a lot of messaging on that, hoping that uh, that situation will be uh, corrected. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chris? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, I'm, I'm curious as you guys are, are thinking through this program and obviously, you know, we've been talking about something similar of direct assistance to farmers. I, I'm struck by this discussion we've had over the last few years around water quality and some of the BMPs and the state dollars going in there. And in those discussions, we've reflected on the dynamic of, of paying to upgrade facilities for water purposes in this case, with the kind of haunting prospect that the farms, you know, there's so much pressure on the farms that basically the public makes an investment only to have the farm close in a year or two. And, and I guess I'm wondering, has there been any discussion uh, as you start thinking through a program around investment for transition planning and, and trying to, to, you know, in many cases, well, in all cases, I want farmers to be well paid, fairly paid, but in some cases, propping up operations that have a little bit less uh, of a long horizon doesn't make a ton of sense. And, you know, your agency and extension has done good work on helping people plan for transition and I guess I'm wondering if, if there's any of that kind of thinking uh, surfacing as, as you're trying to explore how to do this. And that's, it's, and, and we, as you talk to farmers, I think farmers will tell you that's the number one need that they have right now outside of, you know, getting to, you know, the, the cash flow and the crisis now. They want, uh, they want help with business planning. They want help with transition planning. Um, we have uh, been working with, you know, we have the farm viability program uh, we've been talking with the Housing Conservation Board. Um, so that's, it, it's a key part of this. And it just about, you know, um, I've got a, a, a dairy advisory board that, that we meet with on a, um, you know, quarterly basis. And we had an exercise recently, and that was the number one ask for them is the, is the transitioning, the, the planning, the so forth. And it's, it's vital to that because uh, we are seeing some, um, uh, dairy farmers uh, that are looking at other options. Um, one that's underway that happened uh, recently, uh, we have a dairy farm in, um, in Lamoille County uh, that just sold its uh, cows. Um, all 300 of them um, went on truck this week or last week, and they are going to go to a, a major goat dairy to supply um, um, goat's milk for Vermont Creamery. Um, they're taking a they're taking a leap of faith with that. And one at one point, you know, the farmers will tell you that's that's a little scary, uh, but they see that this is a this is keeping this is an option that it's it's worked for it's working for them. So Vermont Creamery is excited about it. Uh, the state has um, uh, through working lanes has tried to support that transition. Um, these are these are traditional dairy farmers that had about 300 cows. Great farm. They decided um, this particular market was not for them and they're going to try something differently working with um, Ayersbrook Dairy and in, in, uh, in, uh, in Randolph as well. So you're seeing a little bit of that, but business planning is, is a key part of this and any way we can get people signed up and do that, I think is really, really important. Look at options, uh, you know, tricks of the trade and financing and so forth. Uh, uh, Rose? Yeah, thanks. Had to unmute myself. Uh, 
thanks, um, Secretary Chavitz. It's great to have you here. I know you're all super busy during this crazy time, so thanks. Um, um, we have, it's sort of picking up a little bit on Senator Pearson's question. We've been having a lot of conversations in this committee and I think across the Senate and uh, about um, what what can we do now, uh, sort of the never waste a good crisis kind of uh, attitude of what can we do now to learn lessons from this pandemic and make our agriculture economy um, and food systems more resilient and stronger as we move hopefully out of this crisis and into a sort of new normal. And so uh, while we're obviously talking about what we need to do right now to help dairy farmers through this, um, it sounds, I would like to hear a little bit more about what the agency is talking about um, moving forward that we could help put together with you um, for making things stronger. And part of it sounds like business planning is a big piece of that. Um, but last week we had a really good conversation about things like um, our uh, transportation and delivery system and um, how we might help that, um, how we might do more with farm safety, um, about uh, changing things in our food processing um, uh, uh, systems and, and slaughterhouses and things like that. So just across the board, and I'm wondering, in addition to just giving um, payments right now, what else would be on your top five list of things that we should be doing to moving out of this crisis? Yeah, and that's and that's part of it as we head into the, you know, we're kind of in crisis management now, and, and then we're going to go into the, to the recovery stage. But I think if you look at what's happening out there, um, I think there's been a reset of like, we got to take care of each other. We got to take care of our neighbors. We got to take care of our food system. And, you know, we were kind of comfortable with what was happening, but you're seeing, you know, on the national uh, stage. So you take, take meat, for example. Um, I think people are, are realizing it, it's a little complicated and it was kind of, there was a lot of uh, centralized uh, with you know meat plants and so forth, but one bright spot that we're hearing is our our local uh, meat processing plants are doing quite well now. They're very busy. They probably could do more if they could do more. I mean, we're not at the size and scale of you know what you're seeing in the Midwest or um, you know the Dakotas and Iowa and so forth like that. But I think what you're finding is uh, it's like a reset. It's like okay, um, we're really good at uh, growing vegetables and producing food. And we're great at the, the dairy, it's high quality, but we gotta figure out a way to sort of figure out our, our food system and our channels and how to do that. And that probably gotta be done in a regional aspect, not necessarily just Vermont, we're talking you know, New England, New York, how do we get back into a sort of a regional system as opposed to a, what we've got now is kind of this national system. But I think, um, you know, we're going to have, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, you know, we, we found there were some gaps probably on online. Not everyone was up to speed on um, being able to transition and, and order online. We've seen, we've seen a lot of progress on that in a very short period of time. Particularly the, the Peace Council has, has put up a, a, a um, you know, web-based purchasing. We saw a tremendous activity in CSA, one of the bright spots from what I'm hearing. That seems to be a model of people working. Um, farm stands seem to be, uh, you know, coming along nicely where people like that. I think the only sort of warning of this is we're sort of in a, we don't know what it's all going to be in the end. Because we're kind of like, this is working now, but are we going to go back to something in six months that's going to be the norm again? I don't know. I mean, it's like, that's the challenge we're all having. As you know, as you know, with something that happens today, maybe changed in two days, and it's sort of evolving as, as we as we move along here. So I think <laughs> working on a regional regional food system uh, with our neighbors would be one pocket that we probably need to do some more work on and, 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 and you know, business planning, education, technical assistance, all should be um, something that we, we focus on uh, moving forward. And, and will your plan, whatever it is you're working on right now that you can't reveal yet, will that mm -hmm. include some of this stuff? Um, I, I, I think I think that's some of the stuff. I don't want to say long term, but I want to say that stuff we're, we're going to 
we're going to continue to work on, but I don't think it'll be part of the sort of the crisis plan that we're working on trying to, um, you know, stand up a program right away. But I think that's something that's, um, you know, we've already had discussions and, and, and on a, you know, with Abby and Abby will be joining us to talk a little bit more about other stuff as well, but her division has been working on, you know, um, sort of short-term, mid-term, and then long-term strategies. And we've been talking with, you know, Farm to Plate and Housing Conservation Board, Land Trust, all those organizations that really are supportive of Vermont agriculture. They have to be players in this as well. We have a lot of wonderful people working on this. And we just got to, I don't think we were quite ready. I mean, we were working. Vermont was in a pretty good position because we've kind of been working on a regional food system. So we may be in a better position uh, than some other pockets. And we've got a lot of bright minds um, that are working on this stuff. And we just got to try to put the pieces together so um, we can go forward and farmers can you know, be profitable and, and we can all be fed. And that's another thing we need to keep focused on here is our farmers are feeding us um, and, and they, they do a really, really good job of it. Um, and they work really hard um, uh, each and every day. And um, that I think also has been discovered in this whole thing is, you know, agriculture has had a reset. People are really figuring out, hey, they, they're kind of important and we really need them and we need to figure out this out. So it's, it's, it's better for them so they can be <laughs> on their land and their animals. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Hanson. Um, uh, one question, you know, if we're going to do a direct payment to to farmers, which we ought to do sooner than later, uh, because uh, the fertilizer and feed and seed and all those diesel fuel per, uh, people, you know, they aren't extending these guys any more credit with, because most of them are at the limit. But so we've got to get that that figure done and get it out the door. <clears throat> um, but I'm wondering if, if we're gonna do a direct payment that amounts to anything, it's gonna take millions of dollars. And to do it so it's somewhat fair, uh, we've gotta know what the feds are gonna send in direct payments roughly, you know, how many million. Um, we, um, you know, we need to know how much they're going to maybe get out of um, unemployment, uh, or PPP, plus UPA, uh, and then we need to come up with a number, you know, that tries to fill that gap, and, and we can't, we can't keep farting around until you know, the middle of summer to get this done because they got to get crops in the ground. So do you have any idea how much money the feds are going to send in direct payments? I don't, I don't know exactly how much they're going to send, but I, I know they have capped for dairy. They've capped yeah. the dairy at 125,000. Um, you know, someone in Maple may be able to get some more, you know, on this, on the other, there has been some, discussion that uh, they want to raise those uh, uh, payments, uh, but there's been some resistance to that. Keep in mind, $125,000 to, you know, may sound a lot to, to the public, but consider the inputs uh, that a farmer in, it has. And right now, um, you know, the dairy farmer, this is the most expensive time of year for them. This yeah. is when they're, they're buying seed. This is where they're doing this fertilizer. This is where they're buying supply. This is when they're, they're trucks and tractors are moving at the most. So it's a, it's a perfect storm of low prices and high costs. So the urgency, um, we understand that. We know it's an urgent matter. Uh, we don't want to develop a program if we get to that point that's going to be complicated to get the you know, payments out if we get to that point. Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind, um, every other you know, industry in Vermont is, is also facing hardships as well. So um, you know, we've got to keep in mind there's other interests as well that are in this whole package, but I know that it, from all the discussions we have, we know that agriculture is very important and, and, and the governor has stated a, a number of times, uh, the agency of commerce, uh, we developed, they understand it, uh, the public understands it. We're just going to try to 
you know, get something together and, and hopefully we can we can get something that, to the finish line sooner than later. Well, I think I think we put we put a pretty simple plan together to get the money out the door to the farmer. I mean, if you take the four categories and and you have uh, you know the you just plug in the money and get somebody to write the checks and it's out the door and and we haven't had one complaint from from any of the farmers on the simplicity and the accuracy of of getting that out uh, you know the large guys you just pay them so much on an average you take the average number of cows on large farms NICAT and we capped it out at a thousand uh, you know, the medium size uh, farms and the small farms, and then everybody under 50 gets a flat check because you don't know if they've got 15 cows or 49 cows. And uh, Michael uh, did a good job uh, helping put that together. Um, but if we've got to have a number <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, if we, plug in whatever it is, we could at least get get that out. And, and you know, the governor's got to understand that, you know, sending that out in mid-June, it, it's about a month late. And uh, because we got to get, if you don't get seed in the ground and get these crops planted, what's going to happen is those animals are going to be for sale come fall because there's going to be feed to put them through the winter. Right, um, and we yeah. we we understand the urgency, Senator. We 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 totally agree. We understand the whole um, dynamic of here, and and I know everyone is working really really uh, fast on trying to get something get something together, and 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 um, not only in not only in agriculture but other industries as well, because we know a lot of people are hurting. Well, I mean. Yeah, there's some out there hurting, but their business, a lot of them are businesses that come and go. I mean, our our agriculture and, and regional foods and, and all that, that's something that's been here forever. And we're getting to a critical, down to a critical mass. And we've, we've got to maintain a level or you lose all your infrastructure. I totally uh, agree. Totally agree. We need to. Ruth? Yeah, I just, uh, this may be a question for Abby, um, but um, I'm wondering if you had an update on the summer school meals situation. I know that when we heard from our federal delegation a couple weeks ago, they had applied for, the, Vermont had applied for a waiver to allow for the continuation of food delivery from schools this summer, but that hadn't been approved yet. And I'm wondering if you know if it's been approved, um, because that would that is obviously a summer market for 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 Vermont farmers. And wondering what the status is. Uh, Senator Hardy, this is Abby Willard, Agency of Agriculture. Um, I was just on a call yesterday where that was discussed. Um, I was not current on where that application was at that waiver request, but. My understanding is that the waiver has not yet been accepted to allow the same school meal distribution and delivery mechanism that's happening now occur in the summer. Um, though I think there's there's hope and optimism that, that that will occur and that that will happen in time. So Hunger Free Vermont gave an update on this during um, a farm to plate COVID kind of recovery check-in call and, and Anora was, was optimistic, but not yet done deal. Okay. Is there any, do you think there's anything we should do to push that? Because it's been a while since they applied for that waiver. And I know the other waiver approvals were approved pretty quickly. So I'm just concerned uh, to make sure that schools are able to have these programs stand up over the summer with enough time. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to reach out to Anora to ask her. My understanding is that the simpler waivers were approved and this is a more complicated waiver that 
kind of is just taking, I guess, more deliberation, more discussion. Um, but Anor did not allude to a need for additional push, um, but I will, but I will follow up with her. It's a good question. Okay, Thank you. Of course. Is the uh, is the uh, Abby is the congressional delegation in on this? So they're crowding the people in Washington to get it. You know, see about it. Yeah. 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 They're they're aware and 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 very engaged, as I understand. Yeah. Uh, getting back to uh, the dairy issue, uh, Anson, um, the, uh, I've been in contact with uh, Senator Tarr from uh, Massachusetts, and Mass uh, Massachusetts is very interested in trying to promote this local uh, foods issue, and his, his big issue um, was the, the meat issue. And what, you know, I could, I'd love to see uh, half of our dairy farmers uh, cut down, well, they could all cut down some on their milk, but a lot of them could, could switch from maybe milking uh, 200 cows to milking 100 cows or 150 and running, you know, 50 beef cattle. And, uh, but, but what's going to hold that all up is processing. So sometime during your conversations with ACCD and those folks is, you know, if we built a, a, a nice modern processing facility, say in White River or in that off 8991 in that area where you could go to Hartford or Boston or Providence, um, you know, we could we could develop, if the milk guys don't want to buy the milk and can't sell it, and the Franklin plant isn't included in, in the bankruptcy deal with Dean Foods to DFA, where most of our milk goes, um, you know, we've got to, we've got to think about what the heck are we going to do in the future with all these beautiful fields and, and land that we've got? And, you know, growing beef would, would be, I think, uh, an ideal way to utilize that property. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, and Abby, I know Abby's been working, her team has been working on long-term strategy uh, because of some of the things that we've learned of this. But, I think that is a, that's an opportunity they probably should explore. I know that when the, uh, the Pennsylvania plants and a lot of Vermont dairy coal cows go to Pennsylvania to those plants and those shut down, yeah. uh, there was an Im impact here. Um, so, you know, I guess the question is, could we, uh, could we have something in Vermont for those animals that don't necessarily have to go to Pennsylvania anymore? Could it be done here? But as you know, the, the, some of the knowledge I've learned over the meat processing over the years, it's, it's all about volume and, and getting it through there in an efficient way and, and being able to get enough labor to do it as well. And, uh, but that's one of those long-term strategies and, and Abby, feel free to jump in as well, but we've had discussions about um, that in the past and maybe it's time to restart some of that discussion as well. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it's one of these long-term programs that we you know need to be investigating uh, you know it's uh, an economic driver uh, it would employ uh, like how many people would it employ and and all these things so that when we go to ACCD or they'd be in on it anyways um, you know they could go to the the governor and to us and say look um, you know, we need X millions of dollars to build this plant, but it's going to employ 75 people. It's going to uh, take care of X number of farms or beef animals. Uh, we have the market in Boston and Hartford that we've developed. Uh, you know, all these little questions make a difference whether you, you get the money or you don't get the money when you come up and see us. and. And uh, so it's important to get all that behind the scenes work done. And, uh, you know, 
Good. We might we might be able to do some there's existing plants on that 91 corridor. Also, I don't know they could be possibly uh, expanded as well. So um, we have about 13 I think across the state that are processing in various sizes. But there could be an opportunity to uh, maybe those to expand or more capacity through those um, as well. But I know Abby's working on a, some long term strategies um, as well with her development division. Yeah, and. You know, I don't know about the fruits and, or the veggies, actually. Um, you know, should we have a, if we're going to develop a market where we grow hundreds of acres of, of veggies, we know we got to export those to, to southern New England. Do we need a quick freeze plant or, you know, because you have to supply these, uh, these, um, dealers uh, 12 months of the year and so you know all that is it's coming to a critical point here i mean this this pandemic is is causing us to think different and to do things different and and uh we've got how many million 50 odd million people within a few hours drive of us uh, and we've got all this beautiful land that grows, grows grass and crops, super, super good. Um, you know, we ought to take advantage of that and forget about the Mexico uh, importation of fruits and veggies that we don't know how they were grown or, or what they're doing with them. Uh, but anyways, that's just me and, rambling. And no, and I think some of that work has been done. You know, you know we presented that uh, farm to plate in the agency uh, blueprint. Uh, we found what the gaps, the opportunities, and it, that report has been completed. The second half is underway as well. So some of that work has already been done. Um, and maybe we need to accelerate some of the uh, implementation of that program. But that a lot of that work has already been done with Abby's group and farm to plate and so forth. So that report's there. Um, and, you know, maybe we need to take a look at that and take our three three or four projects out of that plan and say, let's get to it. And maybe we can use it as an opportunity to accelerate that uh, plan as well. And I know the second half of that is is being written as we speak, but uh, I think that's, it's it's there. We just gotta, we just gotta put the pieces together, but I think it would be the long-term strategy. Yeah, thank you, Anson. Okay. Uh, yeah, Ruth. Yeah, I just I I want to underscore that, Anson. I think that's a great idea to to look at what the work that's already been done and how and like I said, let's not waste a crisis. And and we we the Senate has two uh, working groups working. One is a transition working group, and one is a lessons learned longer term working group. And getting those things out there now and having them on the list of, of things that we want to prioritize, I think is really important. So anything you can do, like I said, give us your top five um, that you think these are the things that will make agriculture more resilient, more sustainable, more comprehensive and inclusive or whatever, how, what other, whatever lovely words you want to use. But, um, but the sooner that we can get that, the, the sooner we can get it on our lists and really get it um, in the pipeline for the next you know, six months to a year of, of making sure that we come out of this stronger. So thank you. I know you've done that great work, so let's not waste it. Thank you, Senator. And um, Chris, well, all four of you are on part or on one committee and part on the other. Uh, which one's working on the short-term list? Chris, are, are you working oh, on- We're on the lessons learned, uh, and Brian with me, um, and ag is one of the things we're meant to explore. So, um, you know, we, Brian and I will have some ideas, but we're just barely getting started. Um, we meet uh, our, for the first time later this afternoon, but we'll definitely come back to you, Mr. Chair, potentially Mr. Secretary or Abby, you guys, although we want to keep you working, doing the good work you're doing, but uh, trying to collect, you know, what are some of the things we've learned here? Uh, food vulnerability is a clear one. Food system um, vulnerability, weakness, weak points is a clear one in my mind. Yeah. And Ruth and Anthony, you're on the other one. Um, yep. so, so we're, you know, we're sitting in, 
we and Ag are sitting in a pretty good spot with two members on uh, on each committee. So uh, maybe uh, maybe Abby or whoever does that kind of work uh, for you, Anson, could get that you know material to to uh, Chris and Brian or to uh, Ruth and Anthony. And sure. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. You guys have all got jobs. <laughs> well, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. Get that check out the door. Yeah, that's the right. Guys before auction time. You know um, what you're doing, Senator. You know what you're doing. <laughs> um, so, uh, Abby, did you have anything that you would well, like got, to do? Abby's got some news on farmers markets, if, if I could. We've got a little bit of update on that as that issue has evolved over time. And just we want to congratulate all the farmers. Sorry, that's my dog. Sorry. I'm probably used to that. Pepper. Uh, yeah. So uh, farmers markets. Um, she's got an update on that. Is, is it all right, Senator? If I scoot along here, I've got a, another. Is that you barking? Well, uh, what is it? His his bark is worse than his bite, right? Expression is. You're don't kicking him so you can go, Mr. Yeah. We, we're on to you. Well, Pepper, knock yeah. it off. Yeah, yeah. Knock it off. Well, Play the tape. Tape. okay. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate it. And uh, I don't even know how to hit you. I'm used to the other system. Help me out again. Your voice is losing. Am I out? There, okay. Thank yeah. you, Senator. I'm going to let Abby. Is that okay? You all start with me? Yeah, Brian, you have a question? No, no, I was waving goodbye to Hanson. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. All so right. Next, next week, we'll expect to hear something on the uh, on the we'll, we'll 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 keep you updated just as soon as I've got information. I'll, I'll um, you'll be the first one I give a call to. <laughs> well, I, I'd appreciate that, but probably not half as much as the farmers will yes, appreciate I'm, it. You bet. We're yep. going to work on it. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah, you. thank thank you, Anson. Bye bye. Bye, uh, Abby. Good morning, everyone. Morning. So just morning. before I move into farmers markets, maybe one little piece on the the committees that you're both or you're all on. Um, so while Anson was talking about the state sort of very near term pay, near term payments and support for ag. We are working on a COVID recovery plan for agriculture, which includes some of those more near-term to long-term strategies. And so we are going through the 119 recommendations that are in the Ag Strategic Plan and breaking it out into, right now we have six different categories. The first being dairy transformation, uh, the second business planning, which would include some of that transition succession planning work. The third being supply chain and looking at kind of the both the, the need for improvement as you were talking about Senator Pearson as well as some of the successes that we've had in a local um, strong supply chain. Looking at longer term resiliency and preparedness recommendations for ag as well as for the support organizations like the, like the agency. Also looking at marketing and digital competency, which Anson alluded to, so some of the e-commerce pieces and as well as the buy local marketing messaging. And then a piece that's really sort of generally outside of agricultural agency of agriculture jurisdiction, which is the labor and food access pieces, but they're very tangentially important to a viable um, food system. So, you know, we got some great recommendations that came from the Hunger Free Vermont and Agency of Education around uh, food access. So, you know, again, I think we can look to some of our key partners to help provide some of the best recommendations in those categories of labor and food access. But I think the question is, how quickly do we need this plan and how quickly would you want some of that content? Um, we've been working on it for about a week. I would say we're a couple of weeks away from probably feeling like we have well vetted, prioritized recommendations. But if we need to expedite that process to support both the lessons learned and the um, transition teams, uh, we could. Yeah, Anthony had a question. No, it's just a, <clears throat> excuse me. The transition team that I'm on with, along with Brian, we're, we're supposed to complete our work in terms of coming back with some recommendations within two weeks. So timeline's pretty quick. I just want you to be aware of that. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a free agent. I, I think I was belonging to one of them and then I got transferred. So 
Yeah, there was some about some trade, I some trade Abby, technology. I think it would be great if you could send, even if those are just bullet points, to both of our subcommittees, because I think they do intersect. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. We uh, uh, we met this morning, Anthony and, and I and our committee, and I think we were told two weeks. So if you have, like Brian said, bullet points you could send to the whole committee, that would be helpful. Of course, yeah. And I, and I would just add, Abby, you know, just mark draft all over them. You know, we're, we're just such in a gathering mode here. We don't need your greatest best thinking, just some quick thoughts as we start to just to inform our own thinking. Yeah, and I appreciate the kind of reference to not wasting a, a good crisis because we we too felt like we spent so much time under the direction from you as well as the Senate Ag and Forestry Committee to do this ag strategic plan. And there are so many recommendations that have been vetted and suggested by the industry and other stakeholders that there's really great recommendations there. Some of them being very appropriate during this time, others, you know, maybe longer term investments, but um, there was a lot of work done there. And, and, and as Anson said, there's, you know, the second part of that project is still underway. We won't have the second draft of, I think it's 32 briefs until sometime in maybe the beginning of June or through the month of June. So you know, again, we only have half the half the plan at this point, but there's there's still a lot of great content to work with. Well, you know, we felt this pandemic coming on last year, and that's why we asked you to do that this past summer. Well, Senator, so you should have given us a better warning of, of how bad <laughs> it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it 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 was relevant though even before, but this. I think this is going to push us into getting something done to deal with it. And, and yes, we need to take advantage of, of it. And contribute some resources, which will be really helpful, hopefully. Well, your boss don't get resources very fast, as we just found out. So tell us what you need for money, and we'll <laughs> try to dig it up. Uh, Chris. <laughs> um, Abby, not to add to the workload here, but there's also a moment um, around the state college system where we're putting down some markers for the rural economy and the ag economy and how it fits together strikes me as timely. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if you've had conversations or, or if, if there are others that are brainstorming along those lines and a brainstorm is the right word because it's very early in some sense but that window may close quickly i'm just curious yeah it's a great question i know that there are many food system conversations that are including the vermont state college's circumstance um, as well and i think the timing is really interesting and an opportunity to take advantage of as well. So much of the kind of the conversation around meat processing, for example, is really about having a skilled and trained workforce to be able to open more plants or add additional shifts. And a lot of that labor comes from some of the certificate programs that exist at Vermont Tech yeah. and other places. And so, um, and I think, you know, one of the kind of learned lessons that I would say we've kind of quickly kind of identified is the real value of partnerships and connections. And I've seen partnerships in the last eight weeks that we have never seen before. Um, you know, nonprofits connecting with state agencies that have always disagreed or nonprofit partners working with a private sector that never really had an interaction. And so it is a wonderful sort of opportunity to watch the community that's established in the state. And I think, you know, even just watching what happened for the outpouring of support for Vermont State Colleges with the proposed announcement and seeing people be really impassioned around wanting to look at an alternative plan. So um, I think some of the labor issues would have a really direct and immediate overlap with the Vermont State Colleges conversation. Um, yeah, so I, I, that's a good one to kind of make sure we keep kind of adding into the mix. And maybe even just like uh, the succession planning and you know the, the next generation of ag producers that are attending 
Vermont Tech in particular, that are looking at what the next generation of agriculture will be, either on their family farm or them just choosing to stay in Vermont and start a new business. So we want that innovation and entrepreneurism to stay in the state um, around ag and land management. So, yeah. No, that, that's a good way to look at it, Abby. Um, you know, because we can't, you know, our, our dairy guys, I guess they really like milking cows seven days a week, but <clears throat> you know, if you can't sell it, you've got to change directions and, and uh, you know, this, this could really make a difference um, if we can get these things going. And you know, UBM is good to, you know, they buy a lot of local grown foods in our institutions. And I mean, we, we could do, there's a lot of work left to be done, but you've got to have the infrastructure to be able to supply this, these right. products. Um, any other questions for Abby? Before we move to farmer's markets? Yeah, I, I heard that went pretty well. Yeah, so I would say this last weekend, we were aware of two markets that opened under the guidance that was released and the frequently asked questions kind of clarification that we shared with the industry on Friday. So on May 1st, markets could open. They had some uh, vending restrictions that they needed to follow as well as a fair amount of health and safety requirements for them to be able to be vending. Um, and the two markets that opened, one in Bennington, one in Montpelier, um, did a great job. One was more of a curbside model um, and, and pickup. The other was a, a well-situated, um, socially distanced vendor booths with um, you know, one directional flow through, hand sanitation that was happening as you enter and exit, um, you know, nice distancing between the, uh, those entering the market and those actually purchasing product from the individual vendors. So it, it, they did a great job and they, they kind of worked really hard to adhere to the guidance that was provided and had to make some market shifts by limiting the number of vendors that they could have as well as the vendor types that were allowable under the guidance as of, as of Friday. So, um, I think it was an example of being able to support commerce with the, the public health and safety at the sort of center of their efforts. And I know it wasn't easy for markets and they, they worked hard to, to make it work. And so I think we, everyone was really pleased and it was nice to hear the governor acknowledge them specifically as a model that could be looked to as to how, how we can slowly and safely restart the economy. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so then so yesterday, we, oh, I'm sorry, Senator. Well, I was just gonna ask, are you anticipating more, more to be open like this week or? Yeah, so, so then um, there were markets that were on kind of their own opening schedule. We threw a little bit of a, a curveball, but I think a, a good curveball yesterday, where we actually opened up some of the vending restrictions at markets. And so previously, farmers markets, um, as of Friday, were restricted to food and beverage vending only, and they all needed to be prepackaged, um, intended for off-site consumption, and you know, takeaway. As of yesterday, we updated that guidance. So effective immediately, farmers now markets can now vend both non-edible ag products as well as non-agricultural products at the markets. So that means that uh, they can do crafts, they can do non-edible farm products. So beeswax candles, goat's milk soap, um, fiber and fleeces, um, as well as you know, baskets and crafts and other other edible other non edible items. Um, so that's really exciting, I think, for markets to be able to know that they have a more opened up um, opportunity to engage with their their very loyal customer base. Um, they still have to practice all the public health and safety precautions. They still have to comply with the executive order and the other related guidance in other ways. 
but um, some of the feedback that we had heard, and, and I presume the committee did as well, that um, you know many markets function on a budget based on vendor fees. And with the restrictions on what vendors were allowable at the market was making it difficult for some markets to feel like they had a viable kind of um, market model. And so, so, you know, I really appreciate the flexibility of the farmer's market community where we gave them some guidance and information on Friday and different and new information at the end of the day yesterday. So starting today, markets will have a different, um, they'll be operating under a more or less restrictive um, kind of guidelines around what vendors can be at the market. And yep. yeah, we know that we'll see some additional event markets open this week. Um, this weekend, I think we know at least um, adding one or two markets and for Mother's Day weekend, and then the, then the subsequent week, and then into the beginning of June, we'll start to really see additional markets come online. Yeah, sounds good. Are there questions uh, from any of the committee? Uh, Chris? Uh, Abby, what does that leave? It, um, is it just the distance that's left or is it prepared sort of eat on site food that's left? I guess I'm trying to understand what's not permitted at this moment. Yeah, so still um, all food and beverage available at the market needs to be prepared and packaged for takeaway and consumption off site. So there's still the overarching agenda to not see a congregation in large gatherings at the market. So entertainment activities, music, um, other ways, other other incentives to get people to stay and linger are still are still restricted at markets. Um, but they can vend they can vend anything, including food and beverage, as they could as of Friday. But now they can um, include all their non edible vendors as well as their non ag vendors that do crafts and the like. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Abby? If not, uh, Abby. Um, Try do your darndest to get that stuff up to the um, two committees that um, that are working, so we can keep ahead of the curve on that, and, and uh, hopefully something good will come of it. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. Well, keep up the, the good. See, work. Michael has a question. Right. I would I would just ask that Abby send the updated guidance to the committee because I just went to the agency's website and uh, it still has the April 24th guidance. Oh, yeah. yeah I think it's being it. modified as we speak. So yes, okay. I'll, I'll send it as soon as. Yeah. But what we did do was we took down the FAQ document that spoke to the, what products were allowable and which ones were still restricted. So that okay. didn't feel as relevant any longer. But yes, as soon as the guidance is updated, I'll make sure it's, it's on Great. the website. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Th thanks, Mike. Uh, Michael, um, anything else for Abby? If uh, not, thanks a lot, Abby, and we'll uh, see you sometime. See you sometime. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Have a great day. Okay. okay. Uh, I think next up, uh, Miss Davis, are you on? Yeah, there you are. Um, so you want to you want to give us um, an update on on what uh, uh, you guys are doing at the uh, administration uh, agency? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, buenos dias to everybody. I have uh, interacted with a number of you already, but not in the agriculture context. So it's nice to see you on this. Uh, alternative in these alternative facts in this alternative yeah. realm it's not quite the same <laughs> no no it isn't but we're we're doing what we can so well, first of thank, all thank you, thank you for your time no please it's it's my pleasure i appreciate being here i know that you all have over a number of years heard um from folks reminding us about the importance of remembering our migrant farm workers um, and I'm sure a lot of the statistics that I could mention here, you've already heard them and you already know them. However, I would be remiss not to join the cacophony of voices reminding us to remember our migrant workers. So thank you for having me. That's what I'm really here to talk about today. Um, you already know that 
on our best days as a state and as a nation, our migrant farm workers are exponentially vulnerable in a variety of ways. Uh, risk of injury from farm machinery, risk of illness from things like exposure to pesticides, lack of PPE, which right now, unfortunately, they're in a sort of competition for PPE with, with health workers. Um, things like lack of access to health care. They're also at risk economically, things like wage theft, substandard housing, lack of labor protections. And, and of course, as many of you know, um, that's not by accident, right? We look back in our country's history at things like the New Deal, which strategically excluded domestic and agricultural workers from the labor protections because they were people of color at the time. That's something that's lingered to this day and that still disproportionately impacts communities of color in the United States. So this is a, a long history, you know, they're typically ineligible for unemployment insurance. And so what we're looking at right now is a terrible storm of existing structural inequities that has made this population particularly vulnerable now during an emergency like a COVID-19. So given all of that, I'm really happy to see that the state of Vermont is thinking about the industry and is helping uh, those who are interacting with our migrant population. Um, for example, on last week's hearing, I believe you all discussed the fact that the state is planning to allow reimbursement for health providers who are treating uninsured persons, um, which does have a positive impact on this community specifically. Although we do also wanna make sure that healthcare spaces are safe for them to be presenting in the first place, right? Um, I'm, you know, it's really great to hear the updates about how the state is handling um, relief for the agriculture industry, specifically for dairy. And so I would say that next up for us is the need to protect the workers themselves and others who are shut out of resources being offered by the Fed. Yeah, and Chris, um... You, I believe you, Senator Pearson, I think you talked to a um, chair of the health and welfare in regards to the health care issues and, and, um, God, and Susanna should speak up if I'm wrong, but what we understand is that the feds have made it clear now that money can go to help pay for clinics that are treating uninsured, which would include our migrant workers, um, so that, you know, as, as we were hearing the catalog of injustice, uh, sort of striking these <clears throat> valuable workers, the healthcare one seemed acute to me in that we're in a health pandemic. Uh, so I'm not sure how we get the word out that people can have some confidence that they won't be bankrupt by seeking medical care, but that does seem like a positive development. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> and a lot of that just is going to have to, we're just going to have to, it takes a lot of time to do the kind of trust building that we need to do with communities who have been burned before, right, by, by folks, um, by, by different folks at different levels of government, whether it's local, state, or federal. Um, that's going to take a lot of time, and we're going to have to make sure that we demonstrate that we really mean it when we say, no, you're safe. We're not going to secretly have, um, we know we're not going to have our employees surreptitiously handing over your information immigration authorities or, or what have you. Yeah, Ruth had a question. Or... Um, well, first, I just want to thank uh, Susanna for being here and, and talking to us about this issue. Um, so thank you. Um, and I just wanted to underscore that I think that in uh, many communities uh, here in Addison County, the, the the largest healthcare provider for migrant farm workers is the Open Door Clinic. And we got testimony from them a couple of weeks ago with a story about a worker who was presumed to be positive for COVID. So it was really interesting to hear sort of all of the mishigash and steps they had to go through to get health care, but they did get health care and recovered um, and turned out actually not to be positive, which is interesting in the end. But um, there is a lot of trust here in Addison County with the Open Door Clinic and um, the migrant farm community and the farmers who employ them. So I do want to underscore that that has been around for 30 years now and has been a, a really good resource 
for that community. And I think there is a lot of trust. Um, and I do hope that the Open Door Clinic and others um, in the state that provide this vital service are able to get some of the CARES Act money. So it's good to hear that that's, that has been okayed. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that I've been working on trying to figure out a way to provide direct payments to migrant farm workers themselves um, because they did not um, were not able to receive the federal stimulus funding that 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 we all enjoyed um, or most of us enjoyed um, and. Um, there are some legal barriers that I'm working, <laughs> I'm trying to work through with uh, Michael O'Grady and his colleagues at the Legislative Council, but we're still working on how that might or might not work. Um, but did want you to know that it is on my mind and I think the whole committee's mind um, and how we might be able to include them in a sort of ag relief package that's more holistic. Um, so uh, it's not, they are not forgotten. So I just wanted you to know that we're working on that. Yeah. Uh, Anthony? Uh, Suzanne, I just wonder, we heard from uh, Migrant Justice a couple of weeks ago about the idea of a fund similar to what Senator Hardy was just talking about. I'm wondering whether you've been in touch with them and whether you have any vision of how such a fund would work or where, the, where it would be targeted. Just you know, what your thoughts might be about that and whether it's something the administration or folks you're talking to would be open to at all. Yeah, this is, I'm really glad, um, I'm really glad that you all have raised this issue because that was actually the next thing I was going to uh, bring up. So yes, I have been in touch with a number of the advocates and with folks internally um, in the administration just for some pre preliminary conversations on this topic. And some of the, some of my initial impressions are, are as follows. One, it's important, I like to remind people that there are a lot of people in addition to migrant, um, to undocumented folks who would be excluded from federal COVID relief funds. Um, it includes people who are, um, it includes people who are undocumented who are here, but it also includes people who are here on things like student visas, those who have legal immigration status here, but who don't have social security numbers and also mixed status families. Those are families of people who some might be undocumented, some might not. That includes eight, more than 8 million people who are US citizens. So in other words, when we talk about federal relief funds going to every American or every adult American, we're actually excluding over 8 million citizens simply because they're married or related to a person who does not have legal status in the country. So this is really important when we think about who's being shut out of the federal relief funds. So just on a just out front, I would say I, I feel very strongly that um, Vermont should consider this sort of a fund for its undocumented population or for anyone who's shut out of receiving federal uh, stimulus funds. I also think that the majority of the people in Vermont who would benefit from such a fund are likely to be workers on Vermont's farms. However, I wonder if this is something that, that should be part of an agriculture, of, of a bigger agriculture bill, or if it should be, um, or if it should take shape in another space. I say this again, because it does include more than just migrant farm workers. So that's something that you all with, with your other colleagues might wanna consider. Um, the other thing that I would say is that I have been in contact with the advocates. I know that you all hear from them regularly. And I do think it's incredibly important that we include them and other stakeholders in the drafting of such a bill. I know that you all have a lot of deep uh, contact and communication with your constituencies. And yet I find uh, in, in various tours in different governments and different jurisdictions that community groups always have such a close ear to the ground um, and are often really on, on the, first, the first edge, or however you say that, uh, cutting edge of, of what uh, folks need. So- did you, um, did, did you find, or have you found um, in your uh, findings that there's a majority of these folks that, that work on 
farms or dairy farms, but there's also a lot of uh, seasonal workers that come here that come in the spring and work way through uh, the fall. Are you including those folks also into your numbers? You know, I'm really thinking primarily of the folks who uh, are in the United States here making their lives, oh. who are shut out of federal funds. Um, of course, I I mean, if, if, if there's money laying around, <laughs> then of course I would be uh, in favor of including any and everyone who, who supports uh, American industry and the American economy in any way, whether it's seasonal workers on farms or another um, or in other sectors of the economy. However, I think that given the limitations of a lot of this funding, it would be my priority to focus on those who are here as really as part of the community who are often overlooked in other ways. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Anthony. I was just going back to what you said about whether it should be part of agriculture bailout package or whether it should be separated. And I think that from my point of view, given the fact that we, it's a long, it's going to be a difficult process, I think, to gain a lot of support for this. But I think it makes sense to integrate it into an agricultural support program. I mean, if we're going to be given millions of dollars, literally, to dairy farmers, it would make some sense that to fold in some money for the people who are actually doing the work on the dairy farms, because they're the ones who are out there risking their the injuries and their health. So I think it would make sense to try to do it as part of a larger dairy support project or system that we put together so that the workers actually benefit a little bit from the amount of money that we're going to give the farmers. I think like, I'm, I'm in a great position because it sounds like what I'm hearing from you is that we are clamoring to be the ones to get this done. And that is a beautiful, that's a beautiful thing to hear. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, my concern is, is, is how can we get this done? And whatever vehicle makes the most sense, then um, you know I, I I think that's worth support. Sorry, Mr. Chair, you were going to say something. Well, I I think what we would we would probably want to do is load in if when we put a bill together, either in our committee or suggestions to some other committee. <clears throat> a portion of this money would go to the employees of the individual farmers, that it wouldn't be all just for them to use for seed feed, fertilizer, and diesel, that some of that would be used to offset uh, the risk that the employees have gone through. And probably wouldn't mention anything about documented, undocumented, uh, anything about who they are, everybody would get used equally. And, and I think, I think, I, go ahead. I, think, I think that's correct, Mr. Chair, that, you know, um, and I think that it's important that we be explicit about that because what we're seeing in other sectors around the country is that um, funds that are intended to go to workers instead are being held by employers and used for other purposes or worse, just left in their bank accounts because they're afraid to use them. And which really undermines the purpose of those funds to begin with. And to your point about um, just making sure it goes to workers without even necessarily having to specify things like immigration status. I, I, I agree with that. And I also think that that's, that's another reason that we may consider um, making sure that this is, is part of yes, an agriculture package, but that it also is designed in a way that it gets to all the folks who are excluded from federal funds, not just those who touch the dairy industry in Vermont. Yeah. So however, we can, we can accomplish that so that everybody who should be entitled to those funds gets them, I think would be appropriate. Yeah, uh, Brian, you had an issue? I did, and I think Susanna's answered part of it, and you have as well, Mr. Chair, and I see Mike, Michael O'Grady is all of a sudden um, Come back on the video. I, I, it seems to me that I remember during Irene that there was federal relief money given to Vermont and some of it did get to undocumented folks and I think there was a clawback provision 
that the state wound up having to pay some of that back. So I just wanted to raise that as an issue, but I think you already have sort of addressed it. I'm not sure what the workaround is on it. Um, and I'm very sympathetic to uh, including as many people as we can uh, with relief efforts, but maybe Michael has more of an idea. Am I totally off base here, Michael? Uh, no, you're not totally off base. And, and this, these are some of the concerns I've been talking to Senator Hardy about. Um, just to back it up though, uh, the New Jersey bill that would have provided um, direct assistance to undocumented and migrant was drafted in a way that it was comprehensive. It, it was assistance to those persons who did not qualify for for um, a payment under the CARES Act stimulus. So it, 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 it did apply across the board. It wasn't just about agriculture or migrant or undocumented. It was to anyone that didn't qualify. So I think that that might be a model that you would wanna look at. Um, unfortunately, that was vetoed by the New Jersey governor uh, on Tuesday um, for, for a couple of different reasons I won't get into. But both the California um, program and the New Jersey program were paid out of state funds. And I, I think that might be a, that was probably a careful consideration. Uh, one, um, because there is a clawback provision in the CARES Act. Two, because the information that might be provided by an applicant underneath a federal stimulus bill uh, potentially the feds could argue that that information needs to be provided to the federal government. And I don't know if you want to do that or not. Um, another issue is that, that, uh, the agency of ag is, um, operates a lot of federally funded programs. And I don't know if you want to, to, um, bring them underneath the, the, kind of scrutiny of the feds and treasury and in, in how they're running some of their programs because they're using this federal funding to, to provide assistance to migrants. So I think you've got some really good options to do this. I think you can look at the New Jersey bill for kind of the scope of who you want to qualify. I think you can look to the California bill to the mechanism for how it's awarded. They did it through a private public partnership with nonprofit organizations. So you basically gave a grant to a nonprofit to run the application program and the awards. And you could probably write in a confidentiality provision into that, that authority. And then you insulated the agency or any state agency from federal kind of scrutiny, you've used state funds, so you don't have federal clawback, um, and you don't have a, a federal, um, basically, demand of right for the information that's provided, <laughs> and you've served everyone that's not um, served by the CARES Act. I, so I, I think that, that that kind of melding New Jersey and California might be some options for you to, to address what you want to do. Yeah. Um, are you working on some something with Ruth on drafting that or or do we yeah, Ruth? Yeah, um, yeah, Michael and I have been exchanging emails uh, uh, over the last couple of days about this. And just before the committee met, he sent me some information similar to what he just stated to the whole committee. So my plan was to follow up with him and uh, I think Becky Wasserman um, to get something drafted for the committee to look at. Yeah, that, uh, that sounds good. Um, I think that framework. Right. Go ahead, please, Susanna. I think that framework sounds really great. Thank you, Michael, you've described it really well. And you know, in thinking about things like um, vetoes in other states and how we can do this creatively. One of the things that I really appreciate about Vermont is that we lead on a lot of these issues. And so 
being able to borrow, to take the good example and to learn from the missteps perhaps in other jurisdictions is where we're really gonna be strong on this. So I completely agree. Um, it, it, it might be, and again, I'm speaking a bit out of turn here because um, these are conversations that I, I still need to have with, um, with folks on the admin side to, to figure out how we can really accomplish this. So, um, so I apologize in advance for my uh, enthusiasm right now, but you know, one of the things that I think about when I think about this issue is uh, when we talked about SALT, the state and local taxes, and that whole fight that happened with uh, my former jurisdiction, New York State, and the federal government when there was a cap put on state and local taxes and the way that the state chose or, or sought to go about it was um, you know, through having folks donate to a state-run charity, which you know, had different implications between charitable contributions versus what counted as a tax. And I'm not gonna get into the whole details of that, but the point is being able to be creative with who's ha uh, managing a program like this is really important. Michael's point about, um, about the fact that we run a lot of federally funded programs and not wanting to jeopardize those programs is a fair point. And I hear it a lot in the criminal justice space here in Vermont, when we think about, um, for example, fair and impartial policing and the relationship that our state police or our statewide policing police agencies have with the federal government, who's always mad at us for not sending enough people to ICE and threatening our um, opioid money, right? And, and having to do that dance. And I think that this is a dance that we may have to do here, but it's it's so worth it. It's worth it for the state, not just for moral reasons, but also for economic reasons. And we're not the only ones in this. Other jurisdictions working on the same issue include Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Washington, Minnesota. Um, we know the California bill already. New York City has a $20 million initiative for the same thing. So I think we're really on the right path and we've just got to figure out how to do it creatively in a way that doesn't jeopardize uh, other federal interests that we may have. <clears throat> well, I mean, one way of dealing with this is you use the federal money to cover a state expense that's, that we're already paying, that qualifies, and then you take that money from that particular issue, move it back into the general fund of the state, and then reallocate it to to this and because financially we haven't got new dollars matter of fact we're you know the next fiscal year is going to be kind of difficult and and we're going to have to duck and dive and weave things uh, back and forth to try to make the most of our dollars but fill those holes um you know, that we can legitimately use the federal money for. So I think, you know, there's there's ways of working that working that out. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do want to mention, I, I do think it's an important issue for this committee to consider. The last I knew, almost 70% of Vermont's milk comes from dairies employing uh, migrant workers. So. Right. To me, it's not unlike General Motors or Ford trying to manufacture a car without taking into account the folks working on the assembly line. It just, so it's good for the Vermont farmer as well as the workers. So I think, I think it's important. Yeah, very much so. Um, other questions for Suzanne? No. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Ruth has- uh, <laughs> One thing. Susanna, as I have a draft available, I can share it with you to take a look at to get your feedback and any help you can you can have with the administration to help um, would be would be welcome. Uh, <laughs> it would be my continued pleasure. Thank you, Senator. Yes, yeah, it's going to take a, all of us pulling that wagon in the same direction to you know to get it done. So uh, anything else uh, from you, Suzanne? No, Mr. Chair, but I will say that um, I am very happy to come back at any time in the future on, on this and other issues. So um, please do keep me in mind if you uh, have any 
thoughts, questions, complaints, comments, concerns that I can help with. Well, and thanks a lot for your time today. And I know the last time we were meeting, we didn't get to you. And uh, so I'm sorry about that, but uh, thanks a lot for your time today. We thank you. really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Brian. Sorry, I was waving goodbye to Susan. <laughs> you caught me waving goodbye. Oh. <laughs> Um, uh, John, uh, you're on. Yeah. Um, so welcome uh, this morning and thank, thanks to you for waiting the last time. We tried to break it up a little, make it a little wider today so you'd have plenty of time. So thanks for hanging with us this morning and, uh, and we're good to get going. Great. Well, thank you, Senator Starr, and thank you to the committee um, and then Linda for organizing this. Um, I, I, I thought I could use my time to really share some thoughts on some themes that we've already heard about. Um, you know, the theme of what do we do now in the midst of crisis to move to a different future for Vermont's yeah, system. That would be good. <laughs> so, and also it's, 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 it was helpful to hear uh, Secretary Tebbett's statements that the number one ask from dairy farms is to help with transition plans and that we have to start thinking about how to build a more resilient regional food system. So that's, that's some of the context of my comments as well. And um, building on, on your statement, Senator Starr, that with this crisis, it's, it's perhaps time to really start thinking differently. Um, so I, I wanna structure my, my opening comments here and I hope we have some time for discussion about you know, asking really three big questions um, that your committee has wrestled with. You know, what are the overarching goals of our Vermont food system, especially coming out of this crisis? Um, what is the current state of the system relative to those goals? Um, and what would a more comprehensive plan look like to get us from here to there? Um, before I suggest some goals and some potential steps to get us there, uh, I, I would like us to consider the current state of production and consumption in Vermont's food system. Um, I know you all know a lot of this, but perhaps some of the public listening and, um, and, and to help frame this uh, for all of us, the conversation about how do we get from here to there. So on the here side, on the production side, we know, and it was emphasized earlier uh, today in committee, that we have a largely export oriented commodity based industry on a shrinking agricultural land base that is highly dependent on the outside world for production inputs and for consumer demand. Um, I don't need to tell this committee, but in, in the depths of the Great Depression in 1935, more than 60% of Vermont's land was in agriculture. And today it's under 15%. 80% um, of the remaining farmland is concentrated in the single industry of dairy, which accounts on any given year between 60 and 70% of our state's agricultural sales. Um, about 85% of milk and dairy products are exported. And, and I really wanna emphasize this point, no other state in the union, no other state is so dominated by a single agricultural commodity, which really puts into focus this question of vulnerability and building a new resilient system. Um, while the land base and total herd size in dairy has shrunk, shrunk considerably since the 1930s, the fact remains that dairy production has more than doubled by transitioning to an input intensive model. Uh, animal density today has increased 250%. Milk per cow has increased 500%. And we've substituted less and less land in agriculture for more and more imported inputs, particularly high energy grains. So this dominant model of the vast majority of Vermont's agricultural production is heavily dependent on outside inputs and outside markets in which we, the state of Vermont and, and our citizens have little to no control. The only way we compete is by cutting costs through greater reliance on mechanization, migrant labor, labor which we just heard about, and decades of looking the other way on our environmental impact. When that's not enough, we borrow money, we make equipment dealers and grain importers wealthy outside of our state, 
and we hope for federal subsidies that are largely dictated by mid midwestern farm politics not by my vermont so this is a moment when i think a lot of us in the vermont food system are saying on the production side enough is enough and that we set a new course so briefly on the consumption side we know the vast majority of food calories consumed in Vermont arrive through corporate controlled national and international supply chains with long food miles, high food waste, and low quality calories. <laughs> uh, the latest data from our farm to plate program tallies local food sales at 12.9%. That's up from 9.7% in 2014, so we're moving in the right direction. And we're actually doing a little better than the New England average of 10%. However, it's the access to the local food system that is much, much, much lower to large portions of our population. One in seven Vermonters are on food stamps. There are a dozen or more food deserts in Vermont, particularly in rural farm communities. And recent data on food insecurity before the pandemic was at 18.3% amongst all households. Survey research, research just done on food insecurity in the first weeks of the pandemic, led by Dr. Meredith Niles at UVM, actually found a significant increase, 33% increase, with over 24% of surveyed households now food insecure. And they also found that 35% of these households are newly food insecure. And 70% of those food insecure households not unsurprisingly have experienced a job loss or disruption caused by the coronavirus. So again, is, is this also the moment when we look to our own to perhaps provide for our own? So these are just a, a couple quick highlights of a highly, what I would characterize as a highly vulnerable Vermont food system that has been made all too clear as you all have emphasized in this current <laughs> pandemic. So, what next, right? That's the big question. I, I understand that we're in crisis mode right now, but we also have the opportunity to lay out goals for a comprehensive food system transformation, in my mind, that would have, have three key characteristics. Um, number one, that was already mentioned this morning um, as, as, a, as a major ask from our dairy community. Number one, a transition away from a single commodity Export oriented, export oriented model towards a diverse, multifunctional agroecological system. Number two, a move away from a demoralized, and in the case of migrant workers, often dehumanized farm labor system and tor towards farm families with living wages and full benefits, supported by an engaged citizenry who are genuinely participating in the Vermont food system. And number three, reduce our reliance on a corporate controlled national and international food supply chain and build a system of regionally coordinated, connected and resilient food hubs that all Vermonters, all Vermonters can afford and access. So what might this comprehensive transformation plan look like? Well, thankfully we don't have to start from scratch because there are many elements of this already in place. But as has been emphasized, these elements tend to be underfunded and tend to be quite isolated from other things going on. Um, as you all have noted, and due to your leadership, the Vermont Agricultural and Food Systems Plan was released in January of this year as a joint effort between the Vermont Agency of Ag, Food and Markets and the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Um, this was a result of Act 83 signed into law by Governor Scott just last May. So I, I'm very, very thankful that, that you all had the foresight a year ago to get this rolling. Um, it includes a product by product identification of bottlenecks and gaps in business and technical assistance, farmer to farmer peer education, and gaps in product marketing. This, this food systems plan is, is, as you've noted, part one of a new farm to plate 2.0 strategic plan to help guide the, the, the work of the next 10 years of our Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund. Um, this uh, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund designated back in 2009 uh, has very, very good broad, broad buy-in. 
its reauthorization last year for another 10 years puts it really in a position for a possible home for a truly, truly comprehensive food system transformation with these overarching goals around food security, regional food system reliance, resilience, and transition to a new product standards around a healthy food system. Uh, you heard last week from Nofa Vermont and Maddie Kepner. Uh, she presented elements of this in testimony um, with very important aspects on both the supply and demand side of Vermont's food system transition. Um, they're thinking around universal school meals program, local purchasing incentive bill that I know has been uh, on the table with clear mandates for schools, correction facilities, hospitals, and other state or quasi-state facilities. Uh, creation of a Vermont, uh, Vermont food sovereignty law, similar to efforts that have happened in Maine. Um, a coordinated import substitution program to really support this expansion of local healthy organic agriculture in Vermont. Um, it's a shame that we import so much of our organic food into Vermont instead of make it here ourselves. Um, programs on land access support for beginning farmers and farmers of color and coordination with the health department on a phase out of the use of chemicals that are, we know are toxic to pollinators, aquatic, wildlife, and human health. Um, we also have the New England Food Vision as a source of inspiration with a goal of 50% of our food produced within the region by 2060. And there's also a green New England deal that's been in the works that I've had the honor to consult on that is building on a basic needs framework, including housing, healthcare, food, energy, transportation, and clean air and water. So I'll end by, by saying, you know, what's, what's missing <laughs> In all of this work, this kind of piecemeal, underfunded, often isolated work is a vision for Vermont's food system that really benefits all constituents of our system. And this moment is really, really shining a light on who are most vulnerable in our Vermont food system. What's lacking, in my opinion, are resources for coordination and long-term planning yeah. I know that funding planning isn't a sexy thing, but in these moments, we look around and realize we don't have a plan for this. Yeah. Um, planning beyond a single commodity or beyond the current growing season or beyond the current crisis. Um, I'd hate to see us move back to normal because normal was already in crisis in the Vermont food system. Um, what's needed is an approach that invests in this kind of systems level resilience not just farm level, but systems level, with targets, milestones, and new, new mandates for Vermont's food system. Um, our food system needs something akin to Vermont's energy transition plan. And it can't simply be a plan to save an export-oriented commodity-bound dairy sector that just simply can't compete in the current market landscape. Again, the pieces of this comprehensive puzzle are everywhere. Um, coordinating local and regional supply chains will require regular needs assessments at appropriate scales. A state agriculture department that takes this whole systems approach to building resilience in our food system. We need to change the goalposts of our ag, of our ag department. And invest in the planning capacity, if you will, for to have actual food hub managers that are working on connecting our demanders and our suppliers. Um, enabling and supporting Supporting the current and future labor force and a more engaged industry in Vermont's food system will require support for apprenticeships and Vermont transition plans, uh, as was noted by Secretary Tebbets. Um, ecological restoration of decades and decades and decades of farm field compaction and soil erosion. Robust urban agricultural products and community gardens. Um, land access supporting beginner farmers and farmers of color, as was mentioned, and incentives for worker and consumer owned cooperatives that are tied to local and organic food access goals. I think the access piece <laughs> that's been, um, uh, hasn't been considered. So uh, in conclusion, a comprehensive multi-sector approach would actually bring resources in from health from energy, from development, 
recognizing that a resilient food system contributes to good human health outcomes, a more engaged transition to renewable energy, especially in including rural communities, and a rural development model that attracts and retains workers. And perhaps most immediately, the state needs to direct resources to create more local demand over the long run, increasing local food and what European movements for this call public kitchens, including hospitals, schools, colleges, and universities, creating local food mandates tied to public money, um, negotiating reliable institutional contracts at regional and state scales, and instituting aggressive import substitution policies and practices that are focused on food system resilience, access, and diversification. So in, in, in my opinion, studying Vermont's food system for many decades at the University of Vermont, returning to normal in Vermont's food system should not be the long-term goal or maybe even the midterm goal. Normal was already in crisis. So thank you for, my, for taking my testimony and I, I hope there's some time for some discussion. Yeah, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, John. Um, the, is that all in print, uh, John? Yes, I have some, I have notes. It's uh, kind of bullet points, but I'm happy to share my notes with you. Yeah, that would, that would be most helpful, I think, as we move forward to, to have those, if you could. Uh, and then we'll get the questions in, uh, Chris. Uh, thanks, John. Um, I could listen to you talk for a long time and, and uh, you, you know, you paint a uh, you do a good job of painting a broad and overarching picture, which is, uh, in my experience through state government, very difficult to advance in a, a comprehensive solution. So I'd like to just take one little slice of this, although I, uh, I know that's a violation of the spirit of what you're talking about. <laughs> that's and okay. I, I agree with your spirit there. As, a, as somebody who studies economics and, and has been around sort of a is there a rule of thumb on sort of the <laughs> maximum percentage of an economy that a community should accept being dependent on one commodity? I mean, is there a point where, where um, economists go, oh, whoa, 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 you really want to stop before you reach, you know, 45% on one commodity? You know what I'm saying? I, I'm as a way to inform the broader vision, I'm wondering if there are sort of metrics that we can point to or even data out there uh, in the literature world that, that can back up what we all understand is an unhealthy level of dependence on a single commodity. But does, sure, that, sure. does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And, and you're really striking right at the, the, the central nervous system of, of the economic kind of Worldview that we've all that we all live in, and the fairy tale that we've been telling, been, been that been telling ourselves. Um, you know, the absolute kind of core of economics is comparative advantage, right? The core of economics is that we need to create more efficient systems, and we do this by specializing and exchanging. <laughs> but never in the textbooks, never in the econ 101 courses, never in the kind of economic fairy tale that's told to all of us are we told the trade-offs of specialization and trade, trade dependence? Um, you know, the key, key, key trade-off to specialization is lack of diversification, lack of resilience, lack of redundancy, lack of the ability to have bent knees during the time of crisis. Um, this is actually most well known <laughs> in the developing country literature. Um, Vermont quite literally has the developing country model of agriculture, where we have highly specialized in one particular commodity that we have little to no control over both the inputs and the outputs. So we know that when countries do this, uh, and they've been told to do this throughout the global south to specialize in an exchange to the benefit of the importer, right, to get something cheap, but to the detriment of the exporter to make very vulnerable, undiversified systems. So um, I'm taking your specific question and going back up to, to a high level because I think that's the context of Vermont. 
um, again, I, I'll emphasize this point of the 50 states, we have the designation of being the state that's most concentrated in one single commodity in our agricultural system. Um, that has been and, and, and will continue to be um, a very, very vulnerable strategy for, for Vermont's agricultural system. Um, we shouldn't kind of you know, fall into this efficiency logic that that makes for uh, cheap food to feed the world. Um, if I hear that one more time, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw up. Um, <laughs> it's just simply, you know, not true, um, and it's also not not a, not a strategy to build a resilient food system. Well, you don't think big's better than like you know. We we've always been told what well, big's better. If you aren't making it on what you're doing, you got to get bigger so you can get more efficient. If your goal is cheap, cheap I, food and low quality calories, then bigger is better. If your goal I, is healthy food system and a high quality resilient food system, then diversified, small, nimble, resilient is better. So it's yeah. about setting those bigger picture goals for our state and quite frankly, for our ag department. Yeah. Uh, Anthony. Yeah, we used to say if you're losing money on every hundred weight of milk, the solution is to make more milk, right? Make more hundred weights until you <laughs> finally get the stuff out of the bowl. Right. Yeah. You know, John, when I think about where to start with what we're talking about as we move forward, trying to make agriculture more resilient and more successful in Vermont, we sort of we brainstorm, we say, let's come up with the five top priority things we need to do. And I, you know, we talk about the need for more pro processing, the need for food hubs and whatnot. But I keep coming back to the idea that do we need to increase the either the increase or verify that the demand is there before we start moving forward on processing and things like that? Could you say a little bit about demand? I mean, should we be funding like school lunches more and, and uh, feed Vermonters feeding Vermonters at the food bank, things like that, which are going to take state money to do or some money to do? But how important is it that we create demand before we go about doing processing? I, I shouldn't say it that way because I'm not saying yeah. it is more important or not. I'm wondering which what your thought is. No, and I, I think your question is, is, is on the money because we focus so much on, on propping up a production system without thinking enough about creating the demand that a new system will need. Um, that, okay, look, in the biggest sense, demand's there. We all got to eat, right? Um, but the context of a cheap food policy has meant that as a country, we really stand out in terms of the percentage of our family income that's spent on food. Um, Very low. We are an anomaly, yeah. And so um, local food demand is also there. Um, price has been an issue. Um, I often use the example of the recycled paper market. Um, everyone wanted to buy recycled paper, right? But there was no supply because once you put it on the market, it was more expensive than regular paper and no one would buy it. So what the federal government did was is they mandated, they used their spending power, right? to mandate purchases of recycled paper. That overnight created a recycled paper market. Vermont is in a similar situation. Uh, New England is in a similar situation, right? Where the state's buying power, the state's mandate power with, with anything tied to public money needs to create the demand for local organic food. This would start in our schools, okay? This would go to our hospitals. This should be at our universities and colleges. This should be in this vision of regional, uh, regional food hubs. Um, so if, if, you, if you glance across the ocean to Europe, this is exactly what they're doing. They actually have organic agriculture transition plans with targets, with goals to set. And, and they do it not through just hoping and praying that the magic of the marketplace is gonna work. They do it by mandating purchases first in schools, then in hospitals, also in correctional facilities, and by creating re resilient food and a food hub kind of approach. And so they're marching forward at 5% you know, local food, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Denmark is now approaching 30%, and they've created a more resilient food system as, as a consequence, but not through the magic of the marketplace. Um, they but it doesn't, doesn't... use the P word, planning. 
But it doesn't necessarily mean more public dollars being used. It means mandating that they purchase certain kinds of products. Is that true? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. So um, it, 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 it could mean that uh, more of a, a budget is devoted to healthy food. Um, and that's fine of, of, of a school's budget, of a hospital's budget. It doesn't necessarily mean new public dollars. Often these programs are, um, are, are stimulated by public dollars. But we know the metaphor of the you know leaky bucket, right? Once you start to plug leaks and keep money and in industry and production local, you actually increase the tax base, right? Not decrease it. So just like we hear in the climate change debate about how much money Vermonters spend on fossil fuels that is immediately exported from the state, you got to think that one in ten dollars of Vermont's food income is immediately, excuse me, nine in ten dollars is immediately exported from the state. What an economic opportunity to plug those leaks, keep dollars circulating local, create the kinds of tax revenues that 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 we all need to kind of keep these models going. But it requires coordination, planning, regional regional thinking, regional planning, which has also become a bad word in American politics. Um, we need this more than ever. Well, that, that if we were uh, going to try to do 50% of <clears throat> the food that we need, uh, and we're only at 12, uh, that means we need uh, three quarters the time three times the amount of land and three times the amount of processing that we're doing right now to, to reach that. And if you add it in, I don't know if that took in all of New England or just a Pacific region, but it, have you figured out how much land or, or space it would take to require us to get up to that 50% uh, mark? So again, import substitution doesn't necessarily require new land. It really requires um, moving away from uh, highly dependent, vulnerable export markets towards um, guaranteed contracts with local institutions and local, local regional food hubs. hubs. So it's really a, a question of transitioning, as uh, our uh, Secretary of Ag just said, that the number one demand among farmers in Vermont is help with transitions, right? So uh, we've got a lot of land in, um, in a single commodity-based industry that could be uh, repurposed and transitioned to a new vision for a, for, of, of a resilient Vermont food system. Um, well, it takes, it takes an acre to keep a cow going. You know, if you've got a hundred cows, you want to have at least a hundred acres, if not more. Uh, and so if it takes an acre or a cow and you could cut the, the milk and the cow numbers down by, you know, 50,000, you'd have 50,000 acres somewhere in the state that you could either grow veggies on or beef on or beef you'd be back to the acre or cow again but if you were going to grow vegetables to market <clears throat> I mean it seems like we'd have all kinds of of land and we've got a lot of fallow land um, if you run up 22a from uh, down in Fairhaven up through the Virgins I mean, there's acres and acres up through there that haven't seen a plow in 10 years. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and this is the, the part of the vision is the move to a more robust agroecological system, right? With healthy soils that are sinking carbon, with yeah. farms that are keeping yeah. inputs locally, with a vision for moving more towards an organic agriculture that is substituting imported chemicals and, and, and grain that come into Vermont for stuff that's made here locally with new production standards. Um, yeah. this, is, this is the direction that our colleagues in Europe are, are moving. And I really think Vermont could lead the United States in a truly agricultural renaissance. And you, you mentioned early, don't waste a good crisis. Um, I, I don't accept the narrative that we have to kind of wait till this crisis is over to get going. We need to start now. 
we need to be tapping into, for example, the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and saying, part two of your report now has a very different context and a very different mission, right? It's time to build the resilient food system of the future. <clears throat> time to have a couple of high level goals, not these kind of market by market by market goals, right? To really think the kind of food, food that we want. Um, you know, I have the good fortune of being at the University of Vermont and uh, can have, have the space to think more big picture. Um, and, and I think that as, as Senator Pearson said, um, the lack sometimes of big picture thinking for the state is what gets us into these crises over and over and over again. Have you, have you had a chance to talk with uh, your president of the college? This, because why I ask that is, you know, I've been around Montpelier for quite a few years and spent quite a few days in the Ag Committee. Yep. And this year is the first time that a president of the university has ever called and asked to come in and speak to the Ag Committee, which I felt very good about and and was, you know, he's very interested in in the ag uh, sector. Yep. And I think it would be helpful if sometime you got a chance to just visit with him a little bit to Absolutely. give him some of that information. Well, we're, 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 we're getting new leadership in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. The college has, continue, has been moving more towards this food systems approach. Um, there are some legacy parts of, of that college, like the Department of Animal Science, that is still very much tied to a commodity-oriented, uh, heavy import um, production milk system. Um, but other parts of the college are moving towards a more diversified, more agro, agro, agroecological approach. Um, I've worked quite closely, for example, with uh, Professor Ernesto Mendez. Um, who teaches agroecology. Um, this is actually where the demand is from our students. Um, they, they want to come and they want to actually go into farming careers, but in diversified, small scale local agriculture. Um, so it's a huge opportunity for our state to lead the way. Again, I'm not saying anything that is new or profound. All the pieces of the puzzle are in place. We just need a new mandate for our ag agency and a new vision from our state to move forward. Other questions, Ruth? Um, well, thanks, John, for your testimony. Um, I, I, you may already know this, but prior to the pandemic, um, this committee was working on a bill, and we got almost to the finish line with it, on a bill that would um, have done exactly what you were talking about with school foods. And um, we also included um, our correctional facilities in, mm -hmm. in a sort of uh, both a mandate and also incentive program for increasing the percentage of local foods that they purchase. Um, I don't think we'll probably be able to get back to that bill this session, but maybe, I don't know what the, <laughs> what, but uh, we have already been working in this direction. And I, I just, you know, I appreciate what you're saying. I also want to give credit to all the work that's already been done, not just by us. I mean, that's not my point, but by so many people around the state that are working in this direction. And, you know, my point about not wasting a good crisis is let's build on that work and, exactly. and not, and not discount what's already been done. I think there's a lot of credit to be to be given to, to people who've worked really hard. And I, I was really heartened to hear, I, I think it was Abby from the Agency of Ag talking about all these partnerships that have been created in the past eight weeks where people are working together even more than they have and people who used to disagree about sort of small things are now working together on big picture things about how to make things work. So I just wanna you know, provide a little bit of of you know this there is good news out there on what we're doing and yes we need to move in this direction and we have to exactly. give credit's due for all the good work that has been done. I couldn't agree more and that's why I emphasize the pieces of the puzzle are in place. I think this new strategic plan that that uh, both the, the ag department and the Vermont State of Jobs Fund put out just in January <clears throat> has some real important pieces of the puzzle. The bill that you mentioned about uh, mandating Local food purchase is a really important part. Um, I'll just I'll just say that we've all been here before. 
Um, these are exactly the things that have been talked about um, for a long time. Um, I moved to Vermont in 2002 and every year it feels like Groundhog Day. So um, <laughs> I think the opportunity now is very clear. If we use the federal stimulus money, if we use the money from Vermont, if we write new bills just simply to save an export-based commodity, commodity-based agricultural system, instead of doing what our farms are asking us to do, help with a transition to a more robust, resilient Vermont food system, then we'll have missed the, we'll have missed the opportunity. We had an opportunity, um, not quite to this scale, coming out of the Great Recession. Um, oh, this is a big one. This is a big one. I hope you all are, are bold and look, look to the future, not just to the past. Well, we're kind of laid back and slow. You know, we don't, we don't like to get run over too often. Oh no, we don't get run over very often. <laughs> uh, no, this is great, uh, John. And, and I, I think Michael has been on, uh, O'Grady, our legal uh, staff's been on throughout the uh, conversation and, and, um, uh, you know, I think, I don't know if we as a committee will, will get organized well enough to put something like this together, but certainly one of the new committees that's working for like long-term goals for our, you know, that we should be working on in the Senate, we might be able to get something put together to encourage this switch over and this long-term stuff, we might be able to get something together to put into a package yeah. uh, to move forward with. Uh, Ruth? Yeah, I mean, I have, Chris and I have been talking about a sort of bigger package and I sort of laid it out somewhat vaguely uh, with some specifics for Michael. Um, and it's sort of a four part package as I see it. And, um, and you know, the, the bigger picture, longer term stuff is the part that's really vague. And I think it would be really beneficial to have a full committee discussion um, about what we as the five of us feel like we wanna get behind and support and what elements we wanna have in there. I mean, my four big picture, you know, big uh, bullet points were some sort of emergency uh, funding, your part, Bobby, for dairy, and then then the other types of uh, ag that we have heard testimony from last yeah. week. What can we do to help our uh, you know vegetable farmers, turkey farmers, goat farmers, etc. And then um, the migrant farm worker piece that we just talked about, and then the fourth piece, which is the the more vague, but moving forward, some of the things that John just talked about, how do we build uh, system changes to move into a new form of resilient agriculture? So those are the four big pieces that I think if we as a committee can put together a package for agriculture and include all of them not in, you know, together, it would be a stronger coming from this committee. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think, I think, yeah, that that's the way to, to do, but we're gonna, I thought we would have uh, like two or three uh, stages that we would go through uh, rather than tying it all to one, which could drag on for a bit. Um, the, yeah, I think we need to spend some time as a committee to sort sort through all this. Um, and it, it's been very hard to, for us to sit around the table like we do many times in Montpelier and, and just gab about, you know, that, well, if we do this, it, it really help over here, but it's going to take a little bit away from there. And you know, how we do to put all the pieces together. We're, we're very lacking, I think, but we ought, to, we ought to try that one of these days. Just just work on brainstorming or, or moving forward uh, 
for this. Yeah, I miss our little room. It's, <laughs> I can't believe I would say that, but I miss it. <laughs> well, so, Adder, if, I could, if I could just add and just emphasize that, um, you know, I, I think it's a, probably Yogi Berra said, right? If you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. Um, <laughs> I, I really but think some high level. We want to get to. We just don't know quite how. Well, to I, get I, I, for one, as as a citizen of Vermont, would like to see bold high level goals like zero um, food insecurity in Vermont, um, like a livable wage for Vermont farm families, like um, uh, a transition plan towards organic local food. Um, so that I'm not worried about, you know, pesticides and what on my diet. So um, I think if we have those big, bold uh, goals, then you can kind of kind of work backwards from there in, in a truly comprehensive fashion. I think the mandate to the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund has been a great mandate, right, to, to tie yeah. uh, farms to plate. But um, they haven't gotten that, they haven't gotten the mandate, nor has our ag department gotten the mandate to do more than simply, um, you know, save, save the past. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a mandate to really lean into the future. And I, I for one, as a citizen of Vermont, want to know what that, what you all think that future looks like. Um, other questions for John? If if not, uh, John, you'll get that that stuff sent to. I'll, I'll send my notes to Linda right now. Yeah, as soon as I get yep. offline here. Yeah. Michael, thanks, you, thanks a lot, John. Questions or anything? No. I also uh, send along. There's there's a, about a six page uh, draft of a Green New England deal that's been kicking around. I'll get permission from the folks who have who have put that together to see if I can yeah, share that, that with you as well. That should go to Michael. Right. Um, but it's not a legislation. It's more of a like a. It's a policy framework. brief, and then. Um, what you're going to be seeing in, in the coming month or so is a detailed um, po policy briefs for each state in New England, including Vermont, um, that, I've, that I've been advising on with a very, very thorough inventory of um, what's currently being done and what we can build from. Great. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John, for your time. Uh, now you've spent two mornings with us. The one oh. where you didn't get a chance to talk and, and this one, but we really appreciate uh, your time and my pleasure thoughts and we'll uh, we'll be going forward. Um, so I guess uh, committee, well, we're working toward noon. Um, so uh, are there other issues that I want to talk about uh, moving forward? in in time timelines and i didn't know um if some of you got meetings at um on friday and i don't know if we're meeting did, didn't isn't one of the special committees meeting or both of them meeting friday sometime i have no idea For friday morning from eight o'clock to ten o'clock yeah, and then I think, I, you know, Friday mornings at 11 or 1130, we usually go on the floor and and we haven't been given. Right now it says we're going to go on the floor on Thursday morning. On Thursday. Right now, basically the plan is to go on the floor Thursday morning at 930. I don't know how long that'll take us. I have no idea what we're going to do. And then our transition committee meets Friday morning from 10 to 12. Is that no, from eight, from eight to 10. I'm sorry. Well, no, I only know about the one. Oh. I only know about the one. Well, it, so, I, I, sh I may have said 10 to 12. I meant to say 8 to 10 on Friday. 8 to 10. So so potentially ag could meet, well, for an hour and a half, 10.30 to noon or something Good Friday. Noon. Yes. On Friday. Uh, you, would you like to shoot for that? I would, sure. I, yeah. and I, I don't know about anybody else, but I think... I would benefit from um, just talking amongst yeah. ourselves, trying to figure out how we could agree on a strategy like that. Yeah. So why don't we just have a committee meeting of ourselves uh, for that hour and a half, and and uh, you know try to get things squared away in what direction 
we're wanting to go. Good, Ruth? Yeah, that sounds great. I'm just curious, Bobby, if you've gotten any information from leadership about pending legislation. I can't remember where everything was, but we had passed some bills out of this committee and I think they even passed on the floor. The pesticide bill and the hemp bill, they're over in the house, yeah. I think. I can't remember yeah. what else, where everything else was, but I'm wondering what, what you've been told as to what can go forward. Um, well, um, what I've been working with Carolyn coordinating our stuff. And um, so she was going to take or has taken or going to take and any bills that we sent to the house, she's going to send any changes they wanted back in the miscellaneous ag bill, which is sitting on the notice calendar over there. Uh, the the only bill we had in the system that was that was dragging was the um, soil enhancement bill that Chris messed up, not you, Chris, the other Chris uh, that he hung on to in his committee. So we never got it passed it, but it was on notice. Oh, the chicken bill. You mean? Okay. okay. The soil enhancement bill. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got that bill sitting on on notice, uh, but we also got uh, Julie to extend that out till next year. So we don't need to really worry about that particular bill if, unless we want to, and we can talk about that on Friday. The only other thing that that we've got is, you know, I've talked with you off and on about uh, Michael and I've been working on a milk uh, pricing type bill that would change the whole pricing structure, setting up a committee to look at that, a committee of professionals. And we need, we as a committee need to discuss that more and what I'd like to do with that after we've what I've been thinking about doing with that after we have an opportunity as a as a committee as a whole here to maybe load that into one of these midterm long-term plans that we're talking about doing uh, so we have I not that I know of um I don't think we've got a whole lot hanging out there that that's not in a way that we can't we can pass it with that miscellaneous bill that Carolyn's gotten permission from Mitzi to allow that to move forward. So we're gonna have that bill which we can add most anything to. So I told Peter that we didn't have a whole lot to, to um, as separate bills, but that miscellaneous ag bill, you know, we really needed to get hold of. The school, the school food bill, though, that one we passed out of committee, didn't we? But it's probably on the notice calendar somewhere. Or no, is it's in appropriations? Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm gonna well, guess that's not gonna move forward given everything, but there might be an opportunity to to put some parts of it in this sort of transition and long-term planning stuff because i think it will be important moving forward for both schools and ag yeah well yeah we can i'll ask we're going to meet off and on the probes and i'll ask jane about stuff like that I mean the, the the value of school lunches has grown in in the public's mind. I, I believe it's fair to say, um, you know, the the pennies to to help our local food get there got harder. I recognize, but uh, the value statement, the more sustainable economic structure that that bill envisions, the need is only amplified as far as I can see. Yeah. 
So, um, do, do any of you have any other issues that that I have mentioned or forgot about or? No, I I would just say the soil enhancement bill. I I I. It's as relevant as ever. It is not directly. Um, it's not COVID, obviously, but if there is an opportunity, that does strike me. It, there's no cost. So uh, in terms of policy changes, if we get the, the green light, I, I would personally like to see that advance. I think, I think well, as we know, we made it a little broader than the chicken issue. And, and uh, we did that because of the need and the need still sits, still, still exists. You really want to get that baby done, uh, there's a good way to do it. Well, we just load it in the miscellaneous bill. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll speak to Carolyn about it. it. If we did it and sent it back and she agreed to it, it's over, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, yeah. Well, anyway, I, I just am not ready to not do it. If there's a window, let's take it. Well, if you'd like to go, oh, hell, the window's wide open. <laughs> no, if you want to do it, we'll do it. I think that's, no, I'd like to do stuff like that. <laughs> let's do it so Michael doesn't have to work on it again next session. <laughs> uh, so, so Michael, figure out a real short amendment to the miscellaneous bill that will will take care of that and and we can talk about it uh, but you're pretty good at figuring out um, the least amount of words the better uh, anything anything else nope, nope. so um, uh, why don't we uh, plan to meet Friday at, you want to meet from 10.30 to 11.30, and then if you've got meetings later, you know, uh, you'll have a chance to eat lunch, or we'll start at, say, 10.30, sure. and, and go sure. until noon if we have to, or stop at 11.30. Sure. That work? Yep. Yeah. Um, Okay, anything else? I thought we had some good discussions this morning. I'd like to get Anson off um, off uh, and get going on that stuff he's supposed to be working on. But anyways, I hope I wasn't too, too hard on him this morning. But if it's you were a lot appropriate. It'll be a lot better this morning, and it will be the next trip around. I'll tell you that. Uh, but anyways, um, any nothing else? If not, uh, uh, just a question. Question for Michael. Um, we talked about this last time, and I want to put a finer point on it. Is 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 JFO is Ledge Council and JFO working together? to get us kind of ongoing analysis of how the COVID money might be used? So, so that's question number one. Um, I, I think, well, you know, we're, we're using the treasury guidance as the framework. And then we're looking at specific proposals to see if we can fit them within that framework. And just using this dairy assistance proposal as an example, the chair, you know, fleshed out what he wanted to do. I ran it by JFO. We all agreed that it qualifies and we didn't need to do much creatively because it kind of kind of purely fits in those criteria. With some of these other proposals that are coming out, I, just on your meeting, I, I got one. I think it qualifies for two of the three, but I don't see how it qualifies for the third. And so we might have to be creative about that and, and figure out how to do that. So I think generally there's discussion uh, for individual proposals. I think we need to 
we need to use our imagination um, and but also be cautious. Yeah. Well, I'm happy if your imagination is, is engaged. And you know what I, I guess I fear is that I see uh, food resilience as a response to COVID. But what I'm hearing is that it kind of has to be a very direct billable COVID reaction as opposed to in October, what vulnerable vulnerabilities have we uncovered that we just went through that we'd like to guard against because of COVID, but uh, that's not sort of an invoiceable expense. Is that, that's not well said, but is that the theme? Um, to an extent, the, the, the key criteria is it has to be a necessary expenditure due to the public health emergency. But then Treasury goes on and, and provides some opportunity mm -hmm. because it says that those necessary expenditures include response to second order effects of the emergency, such as by providing economic support to those suffering from employment or business interruptions. What, what, it, what is that economic support, right? And I, I think that, that you might be able to develop a, uh, a proactive economic support program for things like transitioning. You know, the dairy pricing, is is uniformly uh, negative over the next six months, right? And you can to maybe develop a program of business assistance for transitioning to something that's not. I, I I think that that's economic support, in my opinion, from someone for employment or business interruption. It would seem, um, Michael, that I'm sorry. Let's, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought you were done. I'm done. <laughs> well, you know, you're never really done, but it's, it's just, it seems to me that if we're that the fact that vegetable farmers or other kind, not non dairy farmers have had the demand drop for their products because schools are out of session, restaurants aren't open, whatnot, that they've experienced a loss of income because of a loss of demand. It seems like they should qualify under this for things like emergency grants or or loans to help them get back on their feet or expand their operations or further diversify that kind of stuff. It just seems like a farm that lost money because they no more demand for their product seems like it should qualify. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and I think you've got, I think Anson or Abby, I'm not sure who said that, that the idle program, emergency disaster loan program put from the feds, that's now available to farmers and that's a $60 billion program. And it, it's, it, it would be available to, to crop farmers. But that this is also, um, I don't know who originally proposed it, but it, it's part of Senator Hardy's four criteria. And it's what I talked about, the um, USDA WIP the wildfires, hurricane indemnity program. It's basically a disaster relief program. And if you have loss of value uh, in your crops, um, then you can apply to a program for assistance or relief. I, I think that that's something that, that could be done. I, what I find as a distinction is that, that some vegetable farmers I hear are doing really well doing better um and that there's more demand for their product that and they're not suffering losses same with with meat um whereas with dairy you have a federal market order which is setting their price for the next five to six months and you know that they're going to suffer um sure. so, so i think building you might want to build two different programs or build yeah. different options depending on the commodity. Yeah, Rose? Yeah, the, what, what I was sort of working out trying to structure and I had told Michael about was more of a program that covered expenses that were related to these farmers having to pivot because of, of COVID. 
Um, like, you know, we heard testimony last week about having to set up a, you know, pay a consultant to revamp a website and set up online ordering because of it, or um, having to change, revamp the way they're processing um, facility works for the turkey farm because of social distancing and all that that's required. And so they're going to have to move things around and there'll be expenses for that or changing their transportation of workers so that they um, can uh, provide a safer transportation or things like that, that we are setting up farm stands. So those are expenses that they have because of COVID because they've had to pivot. Um, and that's what I was trying to figure out because I think you're right, we haven't seen them lose market necessarily, but they have increased expenses in order to maintain the markets that they, that they have. So yeah, Michael, that's that's that, part of what I meant. Yeah, is that, is but that I also think allowable, Michael? Do you think if we're creative? Um, I'm I'm sorry, I'm distracted. I'm getting potential emergency calls on my phone. Um, sorry. I, I, what, we'll I, do, what we'll do is try to keep your thoughts and jot them down, and we can deal with this all Friday. And because it will have an hour and a half or so of just our time. And um, we can we can work on this Friday and then Michael can get back to his emergency phone calls. Uh, if and if you know if there's something particular that you want Michael to dig out, is it okay, Michael, if we get hold of you direct? Yeah, definitely. So we'll call, you know, if any of you have got something that you want to get on for Friday, but we'll have it down as just a general discussion. Good. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, guys? Good luck with your emergency, Michael. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank, thanks a lot, guys. If we don't see you before, we'll see you Friday. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.